It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. 92% of households that join Peloton early in the year are still active a year later. Yeah, if you like cycling to EDM. Not just EDM. Try cycling to Broadway hits, take a scenic hike in Iceland on our treadmill, or row to some 80s jams. Because I have so much free time. Whether you have 30 minutes or just five, Peloton can fit any schedule. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton Tread, Row, or Bikes risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. This podcast may discuss topics graphic in nature and possibly triggering to survivors. We value the safety and well-being of all of our listeners. So please practice personal discretion. Now, enjoy the show. Hey, I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. We're the hosts of the Murder Diaries podcast. We bonded over tacos and true crime after we matched on Bumble BFF. You know, like any normal millennial using an app to meet new friends. Every Thursday, we upload a new episode. In each episode of The Murder Diaries, we tell true crime one story at a time. One week, it's my turn. And the next week, it's mine. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. It's the early morning hours of Saturday, November 29th, 2003, the weekend after Thanksgiving, when Wilma Williams enters her daughter's bedroom, expecting to find 16-year-old Sharita asleep, curled under the covers after an evening out with a girlfriend. Instead, Wilma comes face to face with every parent's worst nightmare, an empty bed. Sharita never returned home. What followed was a frantic search, a gruesome discovery, and a years-long journey to justice. This is the story of Sharita Sunshine Williams. Today's case takes place in Pensacon, New Jersey, a working-class suburb across the river from Philadelphia, where Wilma and Harry Williams raised their three children, Sabrina, Sharita, and John Henry. The three kids were well-known around the relatively safe neighborhood and grew up playing with the kids on their street. Sharita's parents nicknamed her Sunshine because, quote, she had the ability to brighten everyone's day, unquote. And true to her name, she was known to be kind-hearted, bubbly, and always eager to help others, something she hoped to do one day professionally as a social worker. Now, Sharita also took self-care seriously and enjoyed getting glammed up whenever she had the chance. Eyebrows, hair, nails, you name it, she loved it all. So it's no surprise that she was a regular at the Hollywood Beauty Salon, which was a five-minute walk from the Williams family home on Gross Avenue. According to her parents, it's this salon that she was headed to on the rainy afternoon of Friday, November 28th, 2003 for an eyebrow and nail appointment with her best friend, Stoss, who's one of several people who've been renamed in this episode. As Sharita made her way out the front door, bundled in a black shirt with long bell sleeves, a black pea coat, blue jeans with a black leather belt, and tan Timberland boots, Wilma told her daughter to be careful, to which Harry recalls Sharita responded, quote, Mom, I'm 16 years old. I'll be fine. Nobody will bother me. Why would anyone bother me? Unquote. Words that haunt Wilma and Harry Williams to this day because they were the last thing that Sharita ever said to them. When 10 p.m. rolls around and Sharita isn't home, Wilma assumes Sharita is at her best friend Stoss's house thinking that they fell asleep or something along those lines so she isn't worried. It's not until the next morning, Saturday, November 29th, when Wilma finds her daughter's room empty 
that she calls Stas and learns that the two friends never met up that night. But why would Sharita lie? Did she really go to the nail salon? And if she didn't meet up with Stas, then who, if anyone, did she meet up with? Wilma called Sharita's other friends and heard the same story. Nobody had seen or heard from Sharita. The Williams contact the Pensacan Police Department in order to file a missing persons report. Law enforcement promptly arrives at the Williams family home and suggests that Sharita had simply run away. That's something that they refused to entertain. There was no way that Sharita would leave without telling anyone. Police then tell the family that they cannot file a missing persons report until 24 hours pass. We see this all too often, especially in cases where the victim is a teenager. They're automatically assumed as a runaway. And I guess that can be important, especially if they really were a runaway. But in Sharita's case, on top of that, we have this 24-hour wait period before they were allowed to report her missing. We cannot express this enough, and most of us in the true crime community know there is no true requirement to wait any certain time period before reporting somebody missing. If there is a local policy at a police department or a sheriff's office, it's definitely not coming down from any larger law that requires police departments to have to wait that long. The Williams refuse to sit at home and wait for another 24 hours to creep on by because they know in their bones that Sharita is in trouble and that time is of the essence. The family takes it upon themselves to search for their missing teenager, without the help and resources of law enforcement. Harry and Wilma contact everyone they know, friends, family, acquaintances, to help aid in the search. One of the family members Harry calls is his sister, Patricia Hundley. And in her interview with Paula Zahn, Patricia recalls the pain and desperation in her brother's voice when she answered that call. Patricia also acknowledged that nobody knew what to do except to go out into the neighborhood streets some in cars and others on foot, and look for Sharita. The only thing keeping their heads above water was prayer, asking God for a positive outcome. Sharita's friend Lexi later revealed to Wilma that Sharita had a secret, a new relationship with a boy named Kevin who lived across the 36th Street Bridge in the city of Camden. None of the friends had met Kevin, but they knew he was older. He was a recent high school grad and worked two jobs, one as a part-time security guard. Wilma and Harry split up to cover more ground. Harry finds Kevin's address and he goes there. Kevin's mother answers the door and Harry asks her, quote, is my daughter here? Unquote. She says no, but she was here. It turns out Sharita stopped by the night before looking for Kevin, but she never went inside. Or I should clarify, she was never allowed inside because Kevin's mother wouldn't allow her to. Harry recalls that Kevin's mother wasn't concerned that Sharita had gone missing, and that was concerning to Harry, not only because Sharita is his daughter, but given the fact that Camden had a lot of crime and wasn't a place for a young girl to be walking around on her own, especially late at night. In fact, friends said that Sharita was always nervous about her safety in that part of town, and she referred to the bridge as, quote, dark and scary, unquote, to her friends. And I'm seeing photos and um, video coverage of this area. It's all covered in graffiti and trash and looks to not have any streetlights. In fact, it was known to be a place where homeless individuals and those into the drug scene would spend a great deal of time. Meanwhile, Wilma decides to retrace Sharita's steps from the night before, and she couldn't start at the nail salon because it didn't open until later in the day. So she heads straight to the 36th Street Bridge fearing that Sharita was hit by a car or something along those lines. Because at this point, they're considering all possibilities. Wilma's searching the area surrounding the bottom of the bridge when something disturbing catches her attention up the embankment, a lifeless body. She can tell that someone is lying on their back without a coat. And this is late November in New Jersey. It's cold, so something doesn't feel right about it. Wilma assumes that the deceased person could be someone experiencing housing insecurity, but doesn't get any closer to confirm this. She immediately calls 911. Now, Paige, I'm unable to get the audio of this conversation between Wilma and the dispatcher in our episode. However, I do have a part of the transcript so you and our listeners will know what Wilma said on the call. 
She says, quote, my daughter's missing and she walked over this bridge last night. There's a dead body under there, but it ain't her. I'm up under there looking for my daughter, unquote. Police race to the scene. Homicide detective Bill Wheeler leads the investigation. Meanwhile, Wilma calls Harry and tells him over and over, quote, it doesn't look like Sharita, unquote. What's really standing out to me here is Sharita and her mom had a good relationship and they were involved in each other's lives. In instances like that with mother and child, who knows the child better than their mom? You may be onto something. To me, that phone conversation feels almost as if she's in denial or having difficulty coming to terms to believe that the body she found could be her 16-year-old daughter's. But we really don't know what was going on, where she was in relation to the body she found. And we can't even begin to know what she was going through at that moment. Harry and his sister Patricia meet Wilma at the scene, but they arrive after the police have closed off the area with crime scene tape. Investigators believe that Wilma is in fact wrong because right away they notice that the body is that of a young teenage girl. The description of Sharita and her clothing match the body. She was on her back with a bandana around her neck. Detectives examine the body and come across another clue. Her hands were tied behind her back using the black cloth belt of her peacoat. Her jeans were unbuttoned, her shirt opened. Everything was disheveled and her clothes were covered in dirt. Investigators prepare to transport the body to the medical examiner's office and Harry Williams, who's still at the foot of the bridge, begs, for answers. He's a father looking for his daughter, after all. He wants to know, is the victim his daughter, Sharita? Officers do their best to keep Harry away from the scene, not wanting him to see. They then ask Patricia to escort Wilma and Harry away from the scene under the bridge. Without officially confirming the body was Sharita, the officer suggests that the body belonged to her. He said he was 99% sure. Hours pass and detectives finally arrive at the Williams family home. They had found a black leather purse containing Sharita's ID near the body by the bridge. Investigators now show Harry and Wilma a picture of the victim taken at the morgue. And they're devastated, inconsolable. Wilma later reflects on the moment saying, quote, it puts you on your knees. It did me. You just get weak, cry, you scream, you holler, you get mad. I did all of that, unquote. Her sister-in-law, Patricia, further elaborates, saying, quote, it was the kind of scream that brings you to your knees. It was just a very, very emotional scene. Everyone fell apart, unquote. Harry, too, was gutted in that moment. But he also felt responsible. You see, he works as a corrections officer, and through teary, bloodshot eyes, Harry chokes up as he explains to Paula Zahn in their interview, quote, I wore a uniform. I wore a badge. I had an obligation to protect and to serve, but I couldn't protect my own, unquote. It was the worst day of their lives, learning that their daughter, who's described by loved ones as kind-hearted and bubbly, would never have the opportunity to achieve her dreams of going to college and earning a degree in social work. In fact, Sharita and her parents were beginning to visit schools and look at possible programs for her to attend after high school so much life that she would not get to live. Because there were no obvious signs of how Sharita had been murdered, the family and investigators were forced to wait for days until the medical examiner's report was released. And when it was released, it detailed how Sharita had been brutally suffocated to death by two plastic bags from a nearby sporting goods store, Modals. They had been stuffed down her throat where they remained lodged in her death. Detective Sergeant Steve Warwick is quoted as saying, quote, you could barely see them in her throat. And when they took them out to see the size of the bags, it was very eye-opening, unquote. And despite having all of her clothes on when she was found, the medical examiner discovered bruising, deep red marks and abrasions on her hips, indicating her pants and her underwear had been torn off her. This suggested a high probability of her being sexually assaulted prior to her murder. Unfortunately, there was no biological evidence that was uncovered during the autopsy. But her jeans and shirt were still sent to the lab for processing in the hopes of getting some biological evidence uncovered. 
Meanwhile, detectives went back to the crime scene looking for additional evidence. And there they found Sharita's torn underwear and a modal's receipt dated for the same day that Sharita disappeared. Investigators connect the receipt to the bags found during Sharita's autopsy. And it also gave further information about the location of the modal's sporting goods store and the time of purchase, 4.38 p.m., Investigators went to the store looking for video surveillance. And unfortunately, the video cameras weren't much help because they hadn't worked in weeks. Investigators then asked cashiers working that day to think about whether or not they remembered selling someone a black t-shirt, which is what the receipt said was bought. But it was Black Friday and there were so many shoppers at the store that they just couldn't remember a single person in particular. Furthermore, the purchase was made with cash. So all investigators knew is that the person in question bought a black t-shirt. They were now at a dead end. Investigators began retracing Sharita's last known movements. Officers talked to the salon management, but found no evidence that anyone there had anything to do with Sharita's murder. Video surveillance shows Sharita walking from the nail salon in the direction of Camden City. Investigators know she crossed the 36th Street Bridge to head to Kevin's house because they confirmed with Kevin's mother that she had arrived. But this calls into question whether or not Kevin was involved with the murder. He lived within a two-block radius of the bridge and was romantically involved with Sharita. Thus, he became a suspect. During investigators' interview with Kevin's mother, they learn a little bit more about that interaction that evening. Kevin's mother tells them that Sharita had arrived at her door around 6 p.m. that night. But Kevin wasn't available, and she never let Sharita inside. She said that Kevin needed his sleep because he had been working two jobs and needed to sleep before his night shift that started at 11 p.m. He worked all day with his father, slept, and then headed to his second job, at least according to his mother. Authorities heard the same story from Kevin. He never saw Sharita that evening but they had been in contact. Turns out Sharita was furious that Kevin's mom wouldn't let her inside the house, so she called Kevin 16 times from a payphone on 32nd Street. Police wanted to verify this information, so they retrieved the phone records from the payphone, which proved that his story was true. She had called him 16 times, and they had in fact chatted for a few minutes on during one of those phone calls. But then Kevin says he turned off his phone. Police pulled up Kevin's phone records to verify his story, but the phone records told something different. Turns out Kevin answered a call later that night from another girl, 18-year-old Stephanie, who was also romantically involved with Kevin. This raised red flags for investigators, and it made them wonder, did one girl find out about the other? Could Stephanie have been involved in Sharita's death due to jealousy? Detectives bring Stephanie into the station, and they question her but she's stoic and claims not to know who Sharita was. Investigators then ask her to take a voice stress test, which she does, and results indicate deception. They were convinced that she knew more than she was letting on. And they begin to wonder, was Stephanie covering for her boyfriend Kevin, herself, or someone else? And that's what investigators had to figure out. It is important to note that there is no physical evidence connecting Kevin and Stephanie to the crime scene. However, investigators feel it is their responsibility to do their due diligence and follow up on every single lead. That's when there's a huge break in the case. Results finally return from testing done on Charita's clothing and they reveal biological evidence, specifically semen found on one leg of her jeans. This was the first physical evidence that confirmed their theory that Charita had been sexually assaulted. Investigators return to Kevin's home and collect a swab of his DNA for comparison. And it's negative. He had no responsibility in her death. He's eventually cleared and authorities also clear Stephanie. They then put the DNA into CODIS, but there is no match. There's no new leads in the coming months and the case begins to turn cold. But Harry Williams refuses to let detectives forget about Sharita. Almost every Monday morning, Harry calls the investigators saying, quote, this is the father of Sharita Williams, and we're looking for answers, unquote. He later explains that he, quote, pushed them to the brink because he wasn't going to go away, unquote. Extended family also did their part by posting thousands of flyers around the city, hoping for any leads that would help solve Sharita's case. 
And every year on the anniversary of Sharita's death, the Williams family marched across the 36th Street Bridge demanding justice, in addition to community gatherings and vigils to keep the community aware of Sharita's case. And for four years, there was no new information until February 1st, 2007, when police finally got the break that they'd been waiting for, a match in CODIS to the DNA on Sharita's genes. The DNA matched to 21-year-old Warren Dixon, who had been convicted of a drug charge in Philadelphia. His name had never come up in the investigation, and it had only matched recently because it was a new charge. Sharita's family had no idea who Warren Dixon was. He was completely random to them. Investigators later learned that he lived in the area at the time of Sharita's murder. In fact, he lived with his father on 33rd Street, two blocks from Kevin's home. It also turns out that he attended the same high school as Sharita, and he even sat between Sharita and her best friend in English class for a part of a semester, two to three months maximum. Police believe that because Sharita was familiar with Warren, it could have been easy for him to have lured her into an area where he could have attacked her. Investigators went to Pensacon High School to collect Warren's school records, and right after Thanksgiving weekend in 2008, the weekend of Sharita's death, Warren dropped out of school and never returned. They brought him into the station after a probation meeting, and it's there he admitted to knowing her from school, saying that they were friends. And I can't get the interrogation audio for this episode, but I have the transcript and I'm about to read it to you. Warren says, quote, we went to school together. So it's not wrong to say I knew the girl, unquote. The officer responds, quote, and you don't remember if you were with her on the night that it happened or not. You may have been or you may not have been. To which Warren responds, quote, that's what I'm saying. It could have been a school night. You know what I'm saying? It could have been a week. How the f*** am I supposed to know? You know I didn't kill the b***. You know what I'm saying, unquote. Investigators believe that Warren's account of his relationship with Sharita was invented to help explain the evidence found at the crime scene. Warren also mentioned that he may have given Sharita one of his black do-rags or bandanas. And it turns out that investigators had found a black bandana wrapped around Sharita's neck. Sharita's friends later told investigators that there was no way Sharita would have gone or done anything with Warren. One of her friends is quoted as saying, quote, he thought he was tough. He got into a couple of fistfights in school. No one cared for him. None of us knew him, unquote. A Philadelphia Inquirer reporter who covered Sharita's case describes Warren as a loner who had shown unreciprocated interest in Sharita. And at several points in the interrogation, Warren asked if he was responsible, but it was an accident, would he still have to go to jail? He never confessed to murdering Sharita during that interrogation, but that didn't matter to investigators. They had enough evidence to charge him with sexual assault and murder. And that's what they did on February 2nd, 2009. Investigators informed the Williams family of the arrest and tears, quote, of jubilation, according to Harry, overcame him. During the trial, Sharita's mother and aunt wore buttons with her picture to court. And Warren was defiant throughout the entire proceedings. He wouldn't stand up and court officers actually had to lift him out of his chair and onto his feet. He also refused to acknowledge the judge and never answered any questions except when asked whether he had an attorney. He pled guilty to attempted sexual assault and manslaughter. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison and had to be dragged from the courtroom. His behavior was so bad that his own attorney had to apologize, but he never said anything as he left the court. He's set to serve at least 17 years before parole eligibility. He did, however, waive his right to an appeal and will be up for parole in 2026. Sharita's parents plan to be there and make sure that Warren serves the entirety of his sentence. And they were really unhappy with the seemingly light sentence, with her father Harry saying, quote, it wasn't right. I wanted him to go to jail forever. I didn't want him to come out and breathe free air, unquote. But the Williams family isn't ready for Sharita's tragic death to be the end of her story. They hope by sharing Sharita's story that other young women can learn from the tragedy that ended her life. Her father, Harry, says, quote, I always felt that Sharita was going to do something big in life, and she is. She's making people aware by her death. Don't take it that nothing can happen to you because it can, unquote. 
That's where we'll leave it for this week. Until our next episode, you know where to find us at the Murder Diaries pod on TikTok and Instagram. If you'd like to submit a case request, you can submit that to the Murder Diaries pod request at gmail.com. You can also use the form on our website to reach us. And until then, stay safe. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.